what I would like to do today is uh, to find out why you're here, first of all. What do you expect to take away tonight? What do you hear from me? And that's, uh, uh, I have some ideas, but I'm not sure. And I think it's the, the best way is to ask you. So if you could share some of your uh, expectations, I would greatly appreciate it. Anybody? I mean, I know it's, it's very cold, and it's good that it was not on Monday. If, if this were on Monday, I would have been disastrous. This thing would be disastrous, and I don't think I will have any big audience anyway. So what, why are you here? What do you expect? I thought, yeah, go ahead. Okay, how, how to globalize. globalize the country and your career, okay. What else? May I? I thought, yeah, uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, I listened to your speech before and uh, actually, uh, you, in my opinion, you are very much inspiring uh, 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 a lady uh, among the old, so many ladies in Japan. But I would like to send my, uh, give my message to my colleagues, female colleagues in the office, who, in my opinion, should be more ambitious, just like you are. Okay. and uh, seek for the global career. Okay, great, thank you very much. So that uh, target is pretty much women, and I'll be talking a little bit about that later on. What else? I heard that the, uh, the global students are very vocal, and they express, they raise their hands, <laughs> and what's, what's going on in here? I thought, you know, at the same time, everybody raises their hand. Go ahead. Um, how to take my career beyond Tokyo because okay. I've been based here forever, and also how to inspire the managers that I work with mm -hmm. to build their career globally. I mean, I work for a global company, so, but everybody wants to stay in Tokyo for some reason. Okay. It's, um, how to get out of Tokyo, and how to encourage them to get out yeah, of Tokyo. Yeah, beyond, you know, they're very complacent, so how to get beyond the, the comfort zone and, okay. and share um, our knowledge and learn from others. Okay, great. What else? Oh, and a knee broader global student here. Um, I, as a global student here who came from overseas, how I can kind of leverage having an MBA from a Japanese school mm. uh, globally. Okay, great. Anything else? Go ahead. Um, I have a dream uh, in a few days, a uh, few years later, I wanna be, um, uh, moderator at an international conference mm -hmm. uh, because I'm a tr trademark attorney and I want to um, mm, work at more uh, international field. So okay. I want to uh, receive uh, the motivation for that. Beyond Tokyo, leverage. I should have write this. Japanese. A moderator. Those are the kinds of things that I gather. Um, okay. I'm Japanese, I'm working for a Japanese company, but uh, we are trying to be a global company. I'm trying to be a global business leader, so okay. what would be your opinion about what's Asia's strengths? I'm very interested to hear your opinion on that. Okay. Okay. I think I can go on and on and on without making any presentation, but uh, probably I should uh, just go ahead and uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how I see how I see the world, what's what's going on, and what are the kind of things that we could do. And uh, then I, I really would like you to ask questions, interrupt me at any point in time, and ask me questions rather than wait until the last uh, half an hour. Okay, so. Uh, Let's see, I said global career in the new era. A new era. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the world today. And I think the world today is very fragile, as you know. It looks like you know, the, the stones and the po politics, economics, as well as social. You know, if you take a look at anywhere in the world, it's quite fragile. And we really don't know what's going on or what has happened or what will happen. So there are risks everywhere. And I think the risks is something that we need to live with. So it's always around. So rather than trying to reduce risks, we, we might as well live with the, the risk. The borders are opening, as you know. 
we are in the, the boundaryless or the, the, the boardless world. And I think there are a lot of things which are visible today. And we used to not be able to see what's going on. For example, if we may, we may have heard of Syria or Tunisia and so forth, but we have no idea what, what it looks like. But today, we can see what's going on. And that really has a lot of impact on how pe people behave, how people think, and so forth. So at least we know what's going on in Syria. We can take a look at it and so forth, even though that's a very cut out sort of a, you know, a one-sided picture. And as uh, you all know, we're in the era of unprecedented speed. So whatever happens anywhere in the world, you can pretty much tell that's going to affect us in a few hours. It used to be like days or weeks. So I don't, I don't think you, you lived in that era. But I used to send something, you know, international mail. I can just kind of sit and wait for a week or something before they come back. But not so any today. So if you send something to the, uh, to the east coast of the US or the Europe and so forth, you know, in the evening, the next morning, you'll get the answer. So that means that you, you're pretty much 24-7 kind of work. So it's an unprecedented speed is, uh, is going on. So what, what does it mean? I don't think we have a very clear idea of which direction we're going. So there isn't any right direction. You can see the futures are going, uh, moving in any direction. And I think that's more or less what it is. So this is the era, or this is the world today looks quite confusing. There are lots and lots of uncertainties and risks. And we really don't know which direction we're going. And I don't think anybody does. If you go to the international conferences, one of the things which strikes you or struck, struck me is that we have so many experts. And yet, they have very different opinions as to why these things are happening, what we need to do. So I said, some people ask me, what, what's the conclusion? at this conference. And the, uh, the conclusion is there aren't any conclusions because there are so many diverse views. And that's what it is. So what's needed? I think this is the, 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 the quote from Klaus Schwab, who started the, the World Economic Forum. And the Davos is, I know meeting is going to be held next week in Davos. But the, uh, the, the, the topic for this year is uh, resilient dynamism which means that resilience is the ability to adapt to changing contexts while still pursuing critical goals. Dynamism is, uh, requires bold vision and even bolder actions. And what they are saying is that we need both, resilience as well as dynamism. And that's what we're trying to accomplish, which is very, very difficult. You know, resilience is one thing, dynamism is another. How can we reconcile? How can we balance these two? So these are the world that we live in. And the world is, can be now described as very much connected at the same time that they are very divided. And that has been my sort of keyword lately. I used to argue from or to end, but now it's much more like from divide to connect. And let's take a look at how connected we are. The competition goes beyond borders. So whether we're talking about the countries, whether we're talking about the companies, whether we're talking about ourselves, we're competing beyond borders. Regardless uh, whether we are conscious of it or not. And it's very difficult to realize that when we're in Japan, because we're more or less protected by the, uh, by the language. And we don't feel that we're competing against some people in India. But we are in fact. And right now, the, the yen is getting a little bit uh, weaker. So we're not that expensive compared with like three weeks ago. But you know, on the exchange rate, when yen is very strong, we're very, very expensive. According, you know, if we convert it to the dollar, we're very expensive. So we really have to offer as much value to, to fit with that uh, uh, you know, high value or high price. So the competition is beyond borders. There's no question about that. 
and we're hyper-connected. You know, whether we're talking about uh, SNS, I mean, Facebook is like the, the third largest country, right, in terms of the number of people. So we're hyper, I mean, we're not just interconnected, we're hyper-connected, uh, and we're inter interdependent as well. So we, think we, we can figure out we're very much connected today. At the same time, I think we have a lot of divides, whether we are aware of that or not. One of them is digital divide. Those who are connected to internet, internet, who have an access to the internet, and who are not. They live in a very, very different world. And for example, probably your grandparents, I don't know whether your parents are digital, totally digital alien or what, but uh, some of them have absolutely no idea as to what, 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 it, what we mean by being virtual. But your kids, if you have any, or the, the small children today, they're online all the time. So that's a very, very different world. And whether they can talk to each other if they're online or not, whether they are aware of the virtual world or not, is a very big divide, I think. And the same thing was true with the education and so forth. And another thing which I really uh, uh, feel is very, very significant, particularly in Japan, is intergenerational divide. I have come to a few companies, several companies, Japanese large companies, very well established, who have been known as innovative, who have a great brand name. And those who are in the leadership position today, they may be like in 50s, and they know that they had a glorious days. At least they do have the memory. And we were known to be innovative, we were known to be efficient, and we had great brands. Those who are in the 20s, who work for the same company, have absolutely no idea what they're talking about because they don't have any experience. Because since they joined, the company has been beaten by some companies like Korea and China and so forth. So they say, we, you, you, you tell us we are innovative, but we're not. Not anymore, kind of. And it's very, very difficult to connect these two, in, uh, two generations. And I thought, I didn't realize that, but I thought, in my case, it's like I was, I, I talked to some people who are in probably late 70s, early 80s, and they talk about the war. And when they say war, that means the Second World War, right? That's not a Gulf War, it's not the, uh, the mid, uh, uh, Middle East. And they know the war because they have experienced it. And I've heard a, a lot of stories about the war, but I have no experience whatsoever. So it still is the story, so to speak. And I think the intergeneration divide that I talked about between the leaders of the Japanese corporations and the young people who are in 20s or so forth, and the, the, the same corporations, I think that's the same thing. They may have heard of the glorious days of the Japanese companies. But when they take a look at around them, it's not there anymore. So they feel that they know, but they don't. I think that's, and it's, it means that the, their assumptions are very different. So take a look at how high school kids, students, live today. They are very, their lifestyle is very, very different from that when you were in high school. They were constantly online. They were, you know, they have this uh, cell phone and all these things. So it's a very different world. So their assumptions are very different from your assumptions. And it's very difficult to realize that you have different sets of assumptions. And assumptions play a key role because you make a lot of assumptions without being that explicit. But you lead to, you go to the different conclusions based upon, because you have a different kinds of assumptions. And there, is a, there are big divides between education and employment. And I hate to say, but uh, I don't think the educational institutions, probably not uh, Globus, 
I'm not talking about Globus, but most of the existing educational institutions are not offering the curriculum which fits the employment or the, the requirement of today, unfortunately. And so there's a big gap and divide between education and employment. And there are a lot of gap between jobs and people. We have very high unemployment rate throughout the world, but at the same time we have so many jobs which cannot be filled because we don't have enough people with the right set of skills. And that's a global agenda, which I have been working on in the past, uh, e past several years. So there is a big misfit between what's in demand and what's available. So what does it mean? Do we have to be very pessimistic? I would say we don't have to be. I think we're now at the step, at the, uh, the beginning of the new era. I think that 2013 could be the first year of the totally new era. And it really is up to us what's gonna, what, what we make the world to be. And everybody's starting anew. So everybody, whether they are from different countries, gender, age, I think we're at the starting line. Like, you know, marathon and so forth. So we're starting from the, 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 the same line. So what do you do? Do you try not to face the reality, even though the other things are going down? I mean, this shows the people try not to see the reality. So that's one way of reacting to the, the new era. You can continue thinking, I think which we have done for such a long time, or take the plunge. And by the way, this is me. <laughs> and uh, I try to jump off from the, uh, the what they call a uh, high, high uh, uh, stuff, uh, because uh, it, this was a part of the team building. And you have a whole team you know, down, down on the ground. And you go up and you try. So they, t they help you. And you jump off. And that's, that's the, uh, the team building exercise. But you can take the plunge, but take the plunge requires some kind of guts because it's pretty risky. I had no idea whether my team is there or not. So that's, that's something that you have to take a, take a jump. Or you can navigate yourself, and this, this is me again. I had a chance to uh, fly to the small airplane. I didn't, you know, I didn't pilot it, but I had a chance to fly to the small airplane, Piper, uh, very recently. And that was a fabulous, fabulous experience. So I got all excited, and I looked like a professional. So I said, well, and I said, navigate yourself. Because this is your life. And you can do a lot of things on your own. But you, if you try to follow what has been considered to be good, you may end up nowhere. But you can take a plunge, and you can navigate yourself. Because this is your life. Things are changing. We don't know which direction we're going. Nobody does. So we have a lots and lots of freedom and lots and lots of uh, potential. We have a lots and lots of flexibility. So it's really up to you what you make out of your own life, what you make out of your own career, what you make out of your own country, what you make out of your, the whole world. We can, we can definitely make the world a much better place. And this year, 2013, is the first year of that new era. But what do we do? How do we do it? I think one of the things which uh, is often described or prescribed is out-of-box thinking. So rather than trying to use all those frameworks, rather than trying to go through all these industries and companies and so forth, according to the traditional criteria, we can think out of the box. It's much easier said than done, though. How do you do that? That's a, that's a different story. But you can sort of force yourself um, using, not using the framework. And I think it's, it's fine to start with the framework. But you should always remind yourself to go beyond it. The framework has been made, prepared, based upon what's ha ha what has happened in the past. But we are going into the future. 
So some of the frameworks will not be able to be applied. And you are the one who has to decide. So even though you learn all these frameworks, models, and so forth at Globus or any other business school, graduate school, or online teaching, you really need to think yourself and go beyond that because we are in the different era. Another thing is that you can share, which is great. And I think this is one of the, the very clear distinctions between the traditional way of thinking and the new way of thinking. People have had a lot of difficulty sharing ideas. But sharing ideas and collaboration will lead you to an incredible level of creativity and innovation and solution. So you really need to be willing to share your ideas. And um, we have all those means that we can do. We can make that happen. We did not have all those means to share, even though we want it. But today, you can share a lot of things with almost anybody in the world. You can contact whoever the experts or authorities in the world. They may respond to you. And you can express your own views and, and to the, the wide world. And those who find that interesting will get back to you. And they don't really care where you're from, what nationality you are, how old you are, or what gender you are or what kind of background, what kind of educational background, what kind of degree you have. It's all up to what you say, how you think about it, whether you're willing to share that or not, and whether you can make a contribution, not just take them, but t to give. And I think we are really in the era of new combinations. So rather, I mentioned that uh, we should go beyond frameworks. The frameworks is like the, the um, what do you call, you know, boxes. So probably boxes are not going to work anymore. It's much more like a dynamic, you know, circle or a cube or something of that sort. So you really need to think about the new combinations. And this is apple and orange. And we often say that's comparing apple and orange. That means you know, comparing something totally different. But I think today we can combine the two and come up with something new. So the same thing was true with hardware and software. It used to be hardware or software. But we need to have both. We need to have ecosystem. The same thing goes true with the career. We often think about what is my uniqueness? What's my strength? And a lot of people just think about the objective criteria, such as, OK, I have this degree. I'm so so and so years old. I, um, I had this type of experience at this type of company. But that's just half of the story. You can compare a lot of people with the same type of background, but they're very, very different because their soft side is very different and very individual and very subjective. So when we combine the two, hardware as well as software of our own, uh, ourselves, that's a new combination. So don't think about just your degree, your age, your experience. Think about what describes you as a person. And these are the kinds of things that those, only those who work with you, who did some activities together with you, can tell. It, you cannot really write it on the paper. The people don't understand. But you have to have the experience of collaborating. Then you can tell, OK, this person never gives up, even though everybody's tired and so forth. But this is very persistent. This person is very persistent. And that is the kind of uniqueness that only you can tell if you work with him or her. So these, you know, even though you, when you are talking about your own strength, your own uniqueness, think about how can I make myself unique? What is my uniqueness? What is the combination of, that I am very much proud of? In addition to the objective criteria such as degree, such as experience, and such as age, 
and such as different type of uh, licenses and so forth. There are a lot of things that you, you, can, you can explore and identify that makes you unique. And the combination of the two, objective as well as subjective, really makes you as a unique person. Okay, insensitivity to time. I think a lot of people think and a lot, lot of people feel that they want to do something, but they start thinking about it too much and they just kind of miss the timing. Sometimes, I'd be happy to talk about it later on, but sometimes I don't give myself too much time. I just say, I make some commitment. Then you have no excuse to wait because things are moving. And today, as I said, the speed is very fast, very quick, and time will never come back once it's gone. So you really need to be sensitive to time. So do I make a decision now or do I make it later? What do I get if I wait? Do I get anything or do I not? A lot of people say that they're very motivated to try something, but they never do. And I think one of the reasons is that because they don't do it the next day or that day. They wait a little bit. And then they said, well, do I really want to do that? You know, it's going to cost a lot of money. Do I get what I want? And do I have time? I have other things to do. And you, you can just end up with a long list of excuses of not doing. So the, the, the very easy way not making a list of excuses is don't give yourself time to make a list of excuses. Just do it and see what happens. Unless it's something that you, know, you cannot recover. Okay, and diverse views. It always helps to have diverse views. So I'm pretty sure at Globus and other places, when there are disagreements, that's what make the class discussion exciting. So I try at uh, my course now, we, we always ask the question whether you can say yes or no. And we divide, we, we have this, we made the sign saying yes and no. And they, each one, each student has to uh, post their view. It's either yes or no. And uh, they give us reasons beforehand, before we have a class. And in class, everybody has a PC. So they, they sort of put the, the, the either yes or no on top of the, the, their PC, and they can change. And in the process of discussion, they can change from yes to no, no to yes, either way. But that's the kind of thing that we want to do. And it's very interesting because once you sort of get the thing going, uh, we often have a close to 50-50 split. Like out of 20 people, 10 people say yes, 10 people say no. Then the discussion becomes very, very lively and very exciting. Because even though they get the same data, same information, their conclusion is completely different. Which means that there should be some somewhere that they interpret the data differently or they come, they look at it, they look at a different set of data or they had a different assumption. So that is the great way to find out how they differ, what other ideas, what other alternatives there are rather than yours. Because we tend to, one of the things is that when we try to come up with the innovation or new ideas, we've got to have as many as possible. But what happens is that once you get sort of like r close to right idea, you stop thinking. But you've got to have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ideas. Then very crazy ideas come up, and then you can, you can have a lot of choices. So you really have to force yourself to have diverse views. And uh, I, I'm writing a, the, sort of the column in the uh, Nikkei BP, and I think uh, the, the most recent one, I said uh, at uh, some of the companies, you know, if they go out to lunch with the people that you work with, if the boss says, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to order this, everybody else orders. And I think that's the most ridiculous thing. And in my case, even though that's the one that I want, 
I want, I dare to be different, and I dare to order something different. Because I think it's just one small way, but I just want something very different. And because if you follow the same thing, that, that can mean that you don't think. And I think that's the reason why the, the, the eldest, oldest people are often selected as a leader of the committee or something. Because age, you can never go up the pass. And nobody can argue. Because the oldest person is oldest, no matter what, right, among the members. But if you select somebody else, you have to give all the reasons why you selected this person. So you have to think. And that's the kind of thing which I, I really would like to encourage you, to think about it and different, have a different view. If somebody says something, think about the other way. And that's why the debate is very helpful, because you're forced to have a different view. OK? So diverse views. So which do you choose? You do have a choice, as I said. Do you want to connect anywhere in the world, any industry, any organization, any age or gender? Or do you want to be isolated, alone? you know, working along or one field and so forth. I think the, the weather, even though the, the, the world is divided, even though they are hyper-connected, you do have a choice whether you want to get connected or you want to stay isolated. And the choice is yours. In order to get connected, what are the kind of things do we need? I think that the real experience is very important. Even though we do have all those information and in ITS and we can watch what's going on, we can get all the information, being there is very different. So I really would like to encourage you to be there or to experience the, you know, the, the person or the, the area or the field. And uh, it's, uh, it's one thing to, to watch the person in video, in YouTube. It's, uh, it's quite different if you see the person in person. The same thing was true with a lot of other things. So I, I really recommend you to experience yourself. And rather than thinking and debating forever, even though I like debates, actions is what's needed. And it's because we don't know how our ideas or how our thinking is received. So, and that's part of the reason why I moved to KMD, because we value prototyping rather than just making the business plan. So we make things when we think of something and see whether that works or not. So actions is what's needed. And, but as I said, you cannot do a lot of things by yourself. So you need to involve others. And uh, in order to do that, you should be able to express or explain your vision. And you should be able to uh, express what are the kind of things that they can help you with and what you can do for them if you try to engage or involve others. And operating in the whole world. So don't just stick to Tokyo or in Japan. And Tokyo is an attractive city. Uh, this is one of my favorite cities. but. I mean, if you just know Tokyo, that's half or one third or one fourth of the story. And I don't think you appreciate the beauty of Tokyo unless you get out. And unless you get out and live somewhere else and come back and you say, oh, this is what Tokyo offers. So that's one of the things which uh, I really would like to uh, encourage you. Think about the world as your arena. It's not just Tokyo. It's not just Japan. It's, it's not just in, even in Asia. I think Asia is a very exciting place. And in a way, I'm not really sure whether we can just say Asia, because there are different countries. And China, India, and ASEAN, and Indonesia, and Myanmar, and all these countries are very, very different, even though we do share some of the common characteristics. 
And it, I think we, we share more things probably than in Africa. And I just went to uh, Ethiopia last uh, May for the first time. And I didn't realize that there were 54 countries in Africa. We talk about Africa as if Africa is just one place, right? But there are so many different countries, and each one is somewhat different. So uh, the same thing was true with Asia. And I think the, the economic development and the, the, the culture and so forth is quite different, even though I feel that I have seen, I, I sort of feel deja vu when I go to the Asian countries. But I don't feel that when I go to Africa. Africa is a completely different uh, continent to me. I can't relate to. When I go to Asian countries, I, I feel that I saw, this, I saw this scene when I was a kid in Japan or something like that. But anyway, operating in the whole world rather than just in Japan or just in, the, in Tokyo. So uh, what I have been trying to do lately is connecting the divided world. So I think the world is connected, but at the same time, it's very much divided in many ways. So what I've been doing lately is that make sure that we try to connect people, organizations, who are trying to do the similar things uh, to work together to get connected so that we can have a much more power and influence to make the, the, the world a better place and to make an impact and make a difference in the world. And as a matter of fact, I can share with you later on that I have been working on the uh, uh, trying to create the space so that people who are interested in uh, entrepreneurs and new business creation can work together and can get some ideas and advice from the older generation as well as among themselves. So that's one way of doing it. And I, I, have, I just uh, met with a few people who are involved with uh, encouraging the women entrepreneurs. And by, by, having the, by planning the, the business plan contest, by having a different <coughs> kinds of diversity initiatives and so forth. But they are doing it you know, on their own. So they have a similar vision, they have similar objectives, but they're not connected with each other. But if we can get them connected and work together, I think we can really make a difference. And right now, each one is doing and struggling to some extent on their own. And we, get, we don't get connected. And that's why we don't have that much of a power yet. The same thing is true in Japan. To, to the outside world, Japan still is represented, in many cases, by the corporations which, are, which used to be very well known, such as Sony's and Panasonic's and Sharp's and Toshiba's and Hitachi's of the world. But today, it's a very different story. But, and we, I, I know that we have a, quite a few very entrepreneurial young people. But they, and they are connected to some extent behind. But I don't think that, come, that surfaced yet. So when the, the people look at business community in Japan, they still, they still see Yonekura, who is like 70 whatever years old. I don't have any, any particular objection to him. But <laughs> if he represents the business community in Japan, you know, does that mean that this, company, this country has a great potential? I kind of doubt it. So. so we need to have much better faces, and we need to have much more power you know, by connecting with each other. And so that's, uh, so that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to do. And also, not just in Japan, but get connected beyond borders. And you can do it very, very easily today. You don't have to fly 10 hours to get to somewhere. You can just get connected with them. So that's, I think that's the, uh, the, the beauty of today's technology. We can get connected with almost anybody in the world. We can go directly to the person. And we, we don't have to go through the secretaries. We don't have to go through to get the introduction and so forth. We can just send email, or we can just announce. And they may, they may respond. They may not. But you have those means that you can make the best use of. And that's the world today. So my advice to you is start your voyage now.
and don't wait any longer. Don't wait even until tomorrow. You gotta start today. That's my sort of presentation. And since I still have about eight minutes or so, and I'd be happy to answer your questions, or Nakamura-san can join me, and uh, we can start the, the dialogue, and you can join us either way. You have any questions right now? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you for your presentation, and uh, I have one question. Maybe I don't know. Just to Osaka, so, okay. Uh, I'm Hiroki Nishino uh, from Mercury Incorporated. And uh, you talked about the uniqueness of the person. So how can we identify our uniqueness or strengths? Because I have questions from some people. Mm -hmm. that I want to know what my uniqueness, my strengths, but I can't find. And how can I find it? Yeah, uh, two things. One is that you get out of the place where you have been and to find out what you can do. I think that's a very good way of finding your new uniqueness. Because in the, in the organization, in the, the, the setup, in the context where you have been, you're sort of perceived as you know, the person with so and so and so. So you, you're not very sure whether that's your uniqueness or not. But if you go out and start something totally new, then the people there will see you as you. So they may say, oh, you know, you have so and so and so. That's one way of doing it. And another way of doing it is that I think uniqueness always comes with something that you like. So you start off with something that you like. And when you do something that you like, you tend to be very good at it. And you don't, you don't get tired. And so you develop your own skills or your expertise. And that will become your own uniqueness. And uniqueness is something, I think some people sort of misunderstand. Uniqueness is something that you don't, you find one day and that's it. I think uniqueness is something that evolves. Uniqueness is something that explore, you identify, but you refine as you go along. So it's not something set and that's it. So probably my uniqueness Last year is very different from my uniqueness today. And I just found that, let, let me share with you this experience. Uh, I often talk about uh, Davos, and I say uh, the reason, I, I try very hard so that I, can, I am invited back the next year to Davos, to the annual meeting of World Economic Forum. And I have tried, I, I was invited first two years or so, and then I was not. So I said, oh, okay, you know, I'm not, I don't have that much of a uniqueness, not much of a value, right? And then I got invited back again. And then at that point in time, I realized where I was, which what position I have in relation to other people, because you are, you know, you, whether you are invited or whether this lady from Singapore or whether this lady from Thailand is, or China is invited. Because there weren't too many Asian women when I went there the first time. So I was kind of unique. I was quite different. And I was pretty vocal. So they thought, oh, okay, you know, if I invite, if we invite her back, she says something quite interesting. She's from Japan. But then, a few years later, there are more people from Asian countries, women, experts, and much more vocal, right? So my relative value has gone down. And I realize that because I don't get asked to do a moderation or to be a panelist. So that's when you know your uniqueness is, you are losing your uniqueness, right? And this year, I was not invited. So I said, oh, okay. I said, I, and two years ago, 2008, I was not invited either. And that was the time when the financial crisis happened. And I'm not a financial person. So they didn't invite me because I had nothing to offer, right? And the next year, I was invited back. And this year, I was not invited. So I said, oh, OK, probably my uniqueness is gone. And last week, weekend, I got a call and said, we, have, uh, we can invite you as an industry expert which is not a general participant, right? I'm not, my, 
my name is not going to be in the program and so forth, but can you make it? So I said, sure, I'll let me work it out. And as it stands, I'm invited as an industry expert, it, though it's not confirmed. So that's a very good sign of whether my uniqueness, the, the relative uniqueness is going down. So I really have to sharpen my uniqueness or value so that if I want to be invited back next year. So I have to find a way how I can make sure that they see the value of me. And the same thing happened when I was a member of this council, so forth. And I used to be able to play the Japan game, which means that Japan was, as a company or as the country, or as the, we have quite a few Japanese companies which are strong. So I could talk about them. That had some value, but not anymore. Japan is not too much of the, uh, in, in the hot, you know, in the spotlight. So you can't play this Japan or J Japanese business community game anymore. So I really have to find the way that I can identify myself as unique. So that's sort of, you know, one, one example that I could talk about. I have. I'd like to start off. Uh, I'm thinking of running this dialogue in two ways. Uh, I'd like to hear your personal stories in, in life. Sure. How you became a global leader. Uh, that's one way. And I'd like to dig in, in a couple places, especially uh, that the, the students and the audience raised as questions. Yeah. And if I may, I'd, li I'd like to in include communication. And my first question to you, Ishikura-san, is what kind of a, a, a teenage girl were you? What kind of teenage girl? <laughs> uh, when you were, when okay, you were in sure, high school, sure. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I went to junior and high, uh, senior high school Ferris in Yokohama. And uh, we were, I think it, uh, I played a lot of tennis. And that was what I did. And I was like, uh, I love sports, I like athletic, undo kind of. And I did, uh, I, I, that was essentially what I wanted to do. And I really liked English. I liked uh, math and all that stuff, but English was uh, very, uh, my favorite. Partly because it was new in high school, and I wanted, I, I like anything new. And so I liked English, and I also wanted to find out what's beyond the Pacific Ocean. So I thought probably I need to learn how to, how to communicate. And those were the reasons. And uh, I was, I had a very uh, good life. Enjoyed a lot of stuff, music, and we did a lot of uh, shows and musicals and stuff and drama. And uh, uh, I, you can tell how old I am, but we were at the Beatles age. Mm -hmm. So we sort of tried to do the Beatles stuff. And so I remember all the songs without knowing any mm -hmm. meaning. Mm -hmm. So I, I could still sing and stuff, right? And uh, we. Uh, one thing about Ferris is that you're supposed to make your own decision, mm -hmm. but you have to take mm -hmm. the consequence of mm -hmm. your own decision. Mm -hmm. So we were often told that you decide what you want to wear on top of our uniform. Mm -hmm. And if you think that's good for the student, mm -hmm. do it. So we didn't have all those rules. And we were allowed to eat lunch any place mm -hmm. on campus. And if essentially any time. So I always ate lunch much earlier than lunchtime <laughs> because I was starving. So that's the kind of life that we had. And way back, we were even, the, I think probably that's the regular thing now, but when we go to the school excursion, school trips, we could decide where we want to be, uh, visit in groups. And so that was a pretty big risk then, but uh, everybody came back in one piece. So I think we, I learned a lot of things as to you decide on your own, but you have to be responsible for what you do. And so it's very interesting that I have a high school reunion. Everybody is doing a lot of very different things. So there isn't any sort of set lifestyle. And they don't talk about their family. They talk about themselves. They don't talk about their kids, they don't talk about their husbands, which I think is quite unusual. Mm -hmm. 
So that may have sort of formed mm -hmm. some of the things that mm -hmm. I later mm -hmm. did. If we have wine, uh, maybe it might be nice to hear or sing a <laughs> Beatles song, yeah. but uh, let's move on. Um, you go to Sofia University yeah. and you decide to enroll in a U.S. university in yes, exchange. Yes, yes. Uh, at that time, how many of the you know, Sofia students would go abroad? Uh, very few, uh -huh. but I was a member of ESS and there were a lot of scholarships for, men, for men, but very few for women. And I wanted to go, since I was in uh, grade school almost, go overseas, because I wanted to find out what's on the other side of the ocean. And, uh, but I, uh, and I tried to get the scholarship, you know, AFS and Sanke and all that, and I failed in every single one of them, so I couldn't go. So I saved a little bit of money so that I can go like Gogaku Kenshu. Right? And then when I saw the other students who went to Gogaku Kenshu, they were just get, getting together with the Japanese students, and they didn't seem to have any new experience. So I said, this is, not, this is ridiculous. So I was looking for something which I can use the, the money that I saved, but stay much longer on my own. And I just found the, the scholarship. Mm -hmm. and, but I was one of very few mm -hmm. at that point in time. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, when you, you went to uh, St. Mary University yes, yes. In, in Kansas, yeah. you were the only Japanese, or were there few? I was, uh, I was one of the two. Of the there two. was another music uh, major. I see, I see. So you're surrounded by Americans. How, how was that experience? That was a great mm -hmm. experience in the sense that, mm -hmm. I mean, this is way back, so mm -hmm. you might, but it, it was in Kansas, so mm -hmm. it was a countryside. Nobody knew where Japan was kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they told me how, what ketchup was. That's the kind of thing, because they didn't think that I knew what ketchup was, right? And uh, it was a very good experience because I was always asked what I thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't happen in Japan. Mm -hmm. So everybody asked, what do you think? And what do you think? What, what do you think of this music? What do you think of this movie? And I, said, I don't know enough about it. You know, how can I say anything? But then I realized that all they were interested in just my view, just my opinion. So I can say anything I want. So I got very used to just expressing my own view or my, my own preference. Do I like this? Do I not? And then I also learned that if I say, if I meant to say no, but I didn't say no explicitly, they assumed that I said yes. So I got into a lot of trouble because I thought that I said yes. I meant, uh, I meant no, that I can't go. But the other party, because I didn't say I cannot go explicitly, they thought that I would go. So there was a lot of gap of communication. And so that was the experience that I had, and I was quite at a loss as to what to do. But you're on your own, so you have to do something about it, and you learn. And also another thing which I learned was that it's, it's quite miserable to get sick when you're alone in the uh, foreign country because you don't know how to explain what's hurting and you are pretty miserable to start with. So that was the time when I decided that I really need to be physically in good shape. So I, I really become very careful about what I eat, you know, the exercise and so forth. Because in, in a way, you are responsible, and nobody cares for you. And uh, Japan is the society, which is a good part of it, that's a good aspect of the society, that a lot of people care about you and ask you, you know, how you are doing. And in the US, nobody does. You have to say. You have to take an initiative, and I said, I am having this problem, so please help. Then everybody helps, but you have to, take an initiative, which I still find among a lot of Japanese. So I don't see enough people who say, I have a problem, I'm having difficulty, I need help. Or I have to ask each one what you think. And that's a very different style. And I learned, you know, you have to take an initiative, you have to make it up your own mind, you have to be explicit, you have to take the consequence, you have to be responsible for whatever happens to you. 
when I was in the, the, the college. So that may have formed you know, what I do later on. Thank you. Um, actually, I was raised in the United States. I went to elementary school in the United States, uh, junior high school in Canada. And the education was totally different, as you say. Even in elementary school, you have to make a position and you, you have to defend yourself. So all the, how to say, um, homeworks, there was no right answers. But you were to make a, a stand, stance on either political aspect, scientific aspect, mathematical aspect. So mm -hmm. um, it was fun, but very difficult to compare with you know, others. So you know, the, the society pushes you to be unique. Um, mm -hmm. Let me move on to your MBA days. Yes. Um, you came back to Sofia, but uh, the credits were kind of approved mm -hmm. at Sofia. So you didn't really have time for your job search. Right. Uh, you became a professional translator. That's very entrepreneurial. Uh, while you were doing a lot of work, you met a professor from Harvard Business School. He, he, he said to you, I'll be happy to write a letter of recommendation if, if you were to go to a business school. Now, um, from what I know, uh, and uh, yourself being a professor, myself being a professor, we do write a lot of recommendations. Mm -hmm. And we try to push students. But a lot of them do not take that opportunity. Why did you, you know, why were you mm. able to, to, you know, actually apply mm. to a business school, especially mm. to a very difficult school like Darwin? Mm. So uh, can you explain to us a little bit about your decision there? Sure, sure. Mm. Uh, after being a freelance translator, which is a good job because you get paid very well and you get to meet with the, uh, the leaders of the world in different fields. So that's a great job. And you study, you have to study, but you get paid and you meet with these great people, some of whom become the, the president of the companies today or you know, experts and doctors and so forth. Uh, but after a little while, I said, uh, do I really want to continue this? And I wasn't sure whether I am going to be a good communicator or not. And that was not what I wanted to do over the long run. And I thought there was a, I, I don't quite like as much as others. And then the options are pretty limited in the sense of uh, you either start the company of translation or communication, or you get married or whatever, right? You do something different. So that was the time when I was sort of exploring what are the other options. And that was when I met with this professor and I met, I, I did the other, uh, I worked for the, the business school case study type of workshop, and I really liked it. And he liked it, he, they liked it, the faculty members really liked my style, so we worked very well together. And I thought, well, this is what I really like. And he said, uh, uh, what, what do you want to do? So I said, I'm interested in making money in business. And he said, well, why don't you go to business school? And that, at that point in time, MBA was not known at all. So I had no idea what kind of opportunities will open up. But uh, it, he said, I can write you a letter of recommendation. I can recommend some of the good schools if you like so and so and so. So I said, well, and he, after he went back to the US, he sent me this sort of study book for uh, GMAT. And I said, um, how many times does something like this happen in my life? And I said, uh, if I don't grab it, I'm going to be sorry for the rest of my life. So I said, OK, sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I, I tried to study for this GMAT in a very short period of time. And I wrote, the, I, I revised, I drafted. There, was, there wasn't any sort of you know, uh, service to help you filling out the application form, so I had to write on my own. And uh, I did it, and uh, Harvard and Stanford turned me down. I couldn't get in, but Darden did. So I said, sure, why not? And that point in time, I think the, uh, I, I was just kind of ready for some type of change. So it didn't happen just one day. I have had some ideas. I, I think I have hit certain limit with my previous job of translation. So I need something different. 
And so I was exploring, do I need, do I have enough, do I have good boyfriend that I can get married and he's interested. I didn't. So I said, well, that option is gone. So I said, uh, uh, what else? And that was when this thing came up. And I often feel that if I don't grab this, am I going to be sorry for the rest of my life? And that was not the only time that I felt that way. So I said, well, you know, grabbing it doesn't hurt. So I decided to apply. And I got in. And that was what it was. So I really didn't, I didn't have a very clear career strategy. I had no idea what MBA, if I get an MBA, what kind of opportunities would open up. I didn't have enough idea. And I, I just knew that there was something about business school, something about the graduate school. And when I went there, I loved it. I really liked it, even though I struggled. And I had a very hard time, but I knew this is something that I really liked. Thank you. Um, actually, we don't do, you know, um, I have many of MBA students. I, I, I see many of their faces today. But I do write a little recommendation. But I don't send, you know, a book for study. I don't yeah. send a package. Maybe the HBS professor was in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He was just, uh, he was from Germany. And he was sort of like the similar, he, I think he, he thought he saw some of himself in me, probably, trying to get out of the country and do something a little different. So that may be the reason why. In your book, um, you explain about how difficult the first time was mm -hmm. at Darden. And I see a couple of faces of our uh, new MBA students who came to our full-time program from abroad. And they are in their third term. Uh, I think they are in anxiety. Can I finish my MBA? Mm -hmm. uh, will I be able to get a great job? Can, can, can you um, help me with how you felt in your first term? Yeah, first, ter first term was a nightmare, to say the least. And uh, I, the second week, I think, I called my parents and said, don't send me anything more because it's likely that I'm coming home. And I didn't think that, that I could continue because uh, Darden was known to be one of the hardest places. We had three cases a day, five days a week, and we had Saturday papers. So it, that means that we just didn't have any time whatsoever. So everybody finished to lunch in 10 minutes and just went off. And everybody lived very close by. And that kind of thing. And we, we started the class at 8 o'clock in the morning kind of thing. So that was much tougher than, for example, at Harvard, even though the, the quality of the students may be a little different. And Harvard is much more competitive. Uh, so I, I had, uh, and the, the American students had a hard time. So no wonder I had so much. And I thought that I could go, I, I could do OK, because I was a tr translator, right? But uh, there was just uh, no way that I could finish. But if you are given too much, you start thinking, what do I do? How do I do it? And so you learn how to do it much more efficiently. You think about it. And you try to, to sort of balance. I need to get some sleep in order to you know, say something in class, because the contribution is half of your grade, and so forth. And but uh, so I, I just kind of persevered. I sort of tried and tried and not give up, and tried to just kind of hang in. And but uh, there were several times that uh, I wasn't sure whether I could make it. So I went into this uh, one of the professors, OB professor's room, and I cried. One day when I was particularly. Uh, given the hard time because I was not prepared that well in that on that day and they happened to give me a quiz and so that kind of thing you know when you're exhausted when you are sort of under so much stress that just hits you so I went into this OB professor's room and I essentially cried and he let me cry for a little while and said well what what what's the problem so I sort of explain and all that. And I also talk, uh, he said, well, you got to do something with yourself. 
kind of thing. So I said, after you know, crying for a little while, you feel much better, and you sort of start doing whatever. And I also had that little bit of trouble with marketing. So I went into the, 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 to see the marketing professors and said, well, I'm having a little bit of a problem. And uh, he sort of explained, and he said, well, just focus on the next case. And because I was on the, the, the edge, I had a hard time getting noticed. So even though I, I, I had to have a lot of guts to raise my hand, first of all, right? But when I raised my hand, it was very difficult for the professor to notice me. So he said, well, I'll call on you. So be sure to spend a lot of time, be well prepared. And he called on me. And I made some mistakes here and there, but overall it was OK. And I sort of got the sense of, OK, this is how I do this. And I get the sense of how much time I have to spend to, to reach certain level. And that was the, the sort of the, uh, that was, you know, the, the beginning of things got a little better. And I was very lucky, too. In the second semester, the first week, I, this is what I, uh, I may have written on the, the book, but I was not, um, the first week of the second semester is the worst because you have your holidays, you sort of forget about it, come back, and all of a sudden, you're back into this sort of hell, right? <laughs> and so I was tempted to go to sleep the night before, before the marketing. And I said, well, do I go to bed? And for some reason, I stayed up and a little longer, and I finished more or less the analysis. The next day, I got called on. And I, I sort of, so I had to talk like for 20 minutes. And I was a little bit off towards the end, but overall it was okay. So I was very, very lucky. If it didn't happen, if I just went to bed without preparing, I would have never been here. You wouldn't have seen me here. Because I would have never, never finished. So that was, I was just very, very lucky with all these, uh, you know, events. Thank you. Um, it, it is really surprising. Uh, I have a chance to meet many of the, the top Japanese global leaders. And they all say, I had a very hard time when I first was in New York. Uh, Ishikura-san, who is the first uh, female DBA from Harvard, even herself had a very hard time in her MBA. So if you're struggling through the Globus MBA or some other graduate school, don't worry. Uh, but but I, I think, you know, looking at my, my classmates, uh, looking at my juniors, you need to have a presence. It's not necessarily English ability. It's, it's, it's a presence. We know that Ishikura-san is here. We know that Nakamura is here. This kind of presence is, I, I think, needed. Um, what do you do to get presence? Um, it, it may lead to a question of uniqueness, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm. Um, I think you need to be prepared to express your view. You, you need to have your own view about anything. And you need to be prepared to express your view, no matter how unpopular that is, and stand by it. And also... Uh, I think what's important is that you need to enjoy being there. And I, I, as I said, even though I struggled, I really liked the MBA program. I learned, I, I liked what I, I was learning. So that was, oh, okay, this is what I really wanted to do. I had this conviction, very clear, uh, strong conviction. This is what I really, oh, I, I was looking for. So I came to the right place. So I was very happy. And uh, so even though I struggled, but I, I said once I get the, the, the sense of it, and I was able to express, and from then on, I, people started noticing me. And you have to, in order to make the presence, I think you have to make a lot of mistakes. Because I don't think you can be right from the beginning. So I made a lot of mistakes, but people notice you. What's, what's bad, I think it, 
Today I was listening to the English podcast, and I think the, the uh, Supreme Court, one of the judges talked for the first time or something in seven years. I mean, that's something that you should avoid. And the same thing was true with the, the case discussion. You just have to, a case discussion or discussion of any kind, you have to say something. Otherwise, people don't notice you. Even though that's kind of stupid, but you can be stupid, but you can get smarter. So rather than saying, saying nothing, you don't exist, essentially. So I say, if you don't say anything, you are not here. There's no point that you're here. And that's, that's what it is. And it's, tr it's quite tough to do it on the teleconference. And now I get a little bit used to it, so I know how to cut in to some extent and how to sort of talk. But it's quite difficult, particularly so, because it's, it's very late at night. The East Coast, 9 o'clock, it's 11 here at night. So we try to cover many parts of the world. It tends to be very late at night. So you have to sort of motivate yourself and get psyched up and say, I have to say something. And if you just let it go, you let it go. But then people don't start, don't invite you back anymore. That's the reality. Because you would rather like to have people, just think about yourself. You know, if you want to have a meeting, and if you have some choices of inviting some people, you don't want to invite everybody, right, to have some good, meaningful discussion. You want to have people who would express their views, challenge, have different views, rather than people who just sit there and eat lunch. So I said, those people who just come to the meeting and eat lunch, I said, you steal our lunch. Get out. That's lunch <laughs> Um After graduation, you go to Harvard for DBA, and then you enter McKinsey as a professional consultant. Um, because of time, um, uh, I'd like to uh, ask a question. We do have uh, a couple of female yeah. students, female uh, participants today. What is, uh, how, how difficult or how do you enjoy being a female professional? You, know, you have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your professional career. Mm. How have you managed that? Can, can, you, can you give us some sure, sure. advice? Uh, it's always, I, I don't have any kids of my own. Because my uh, husband, who passed away about 11 years ago, uh, was we, we were married about 16, 15 years. But he, had, uh, he was divorced. So he had three kids already. And his ex-wife had these kids. So uh, I, I married him. And we lived together and for like uh, 15 years. But I, at, even before I got married, I made a decision, clear decision that I'm not going to have kids. I was like late, and I was still trying to build myself as a professional. And I realized there was just no way that I could do both. So uh, that was a clear decision that I already made. So that's, that just kind of uh, got much uh, clarified. And, but it was always the struggle to some extent. And being a consultant deprives you of your private life. You just lose your friends. You lose your family, essentially. <laughs> because uh, you have to uh, deliver. And uh, naturally, you lose your friends. That's what happens. So it's, uh, it was a lot of sacrifice on my husband's part, I'm pretty sure, because we invited some people, and I wasn't there or something. And that's, that's not something that you want to do. So you just have to make a decision as to which you, uh, you uh, prefer or which you value. And at one point, I remember when my husband's father passed away, and I had a big presentation which was given to me the next day or something. But uh, we were in Kobe after his funeral. And I was tempted to come back to do that presentation because that was such a big deal. And, uh, but my husband wanted me to stay there. So I thought, well, which do I, you know, what, what do I do? That was a big decision point. I says, I think I can get another job, but I don't think I can get another husband like him. So that was a very clear decision that I value my family much more than my work. And it's not you know, replaceable. 
I realized. Even though he passed away, but uh, I, I thought it was a very, I remember it very, very clearly because that was a pretty big deal. So I said, you know, I asked my boss, you know, please do without me. And I mean, he didn't care, right? <laughs> so, uh, and that was what happened. But that was the time that I was consciously making a decision. Thank you very much. Um, if you follow Iskrosense's Isko Isko uh, blog or Twitter, uh, she writes a lot about uh, cooking for her parents, uh, dining, entertaining uh, her parents. So uh, I think family means a lot to you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah uh, I didn't show my blog, but uh, you can find out. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. Um, if you Google Yoko Ishikura, it will yeah, yeah. come out. So, okay, um, Ishikura-san. Hi. Um, what about uh, you know Japan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, <coughs> Ko Media Design is in uh, Tokyo. Uh, Globus is in, in Tokyo. Uh, we have lots of Japanese audience today. Also in Osaka and Nagoya, uh, there are a couple of mm -hmm. foreign students mm -hmm. who come to study yeah. in Tokyo. What's the advantage of being in Japan? Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty tough question, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, if I have a choice, I would, rather not, I would rather not be in Tokyo, to be very honest, now. Because I think there are more opportunities in other parts of Asia. And Tokyo has a lot of attraction or appeal, no question about that. This is one of my favorite cities. But if I were your age, if I were interested in my career, I'm not sure whether I want to stay in Tokyo or not. And it's because of the reasons that there aren't that many positions, there aren't that many interesting opportunities, and we, have, we are aging society, and those who are in the leadership position are going to stay there. They're not going to leave, unfortunately, even though I try to convince them to leave. But uh, they are changing the law to retirement, you know, to extend the retirement age and so forth. So there isn't that much of an opportunity. And I said, I used to say that uh, those who are trying to get into the, uh, the big Japanese corporations today, if you're young, it's like you're trying to get into the, 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 the train during the rush hour, crowded with all these people. But it doesn't have any destination. It's going to the warehouse. <laughs> but it's very crowded, and nobody gets off. And uh, I think that's more or less what it is. And uh, so I think you have a lot of resources in here in certain areas. So you can, you can just kind of capitalize on those. But try to get funding and try to make, uh, make uh, your name known. I would rather like to go out to other countries. And I run this Gro Global Agenda Seminar at Academy Hills. And we're starting the third, the, another round this year in June. And we had like about 60 participants last year. And one of them had a great environmental <coughs> technology. And it tried to get the funding about three years in Japan by contacting different kinds of uh, organizations. But uh, he couldn't get any. So we essentially told them that get out and you know your technology is great. It has a lot of potential. But if you try three years, that's enough. So you have to give up certain time. And I think he's got some funding outside. So uh, that's overall, you know, probably Globus has a, a lot of venture capital fund or good connections and networks. And uh, so that may be an exception. But uh, it's uh, overall, I would really like the, the people to get out. Or you can get the, the MBA, or you can get the degree in Japan. And I'm not sure how much of a value it does have. And that's, well, today, you know, college degree is in big question. So overall, 
So the degrees, even though that may have some value, I think that, that we are going into the era where substance makes much more of a impact rather than the degree per se. Because we are talking about Coursera and all these things. And um, it's, it's, uh, I think the education is going to change. It's going to under, undergo incredible transformation. So uh, not to mean discouraging you. I think you just need to be aware what Tokyo and Japan can offer. But don't limit yourself. And being in the, the nice environment makes you complacent very often. And, uh, but you need to be aware that there is a limit to it. So if you really want to challenge yourself and want to do a lot of new things on your own, you know, whether it's a, it's a new position in the, the big co corporations in Asia or Africa and so forth, I would rather like to go out. And I think that's what happened in the 60s in, to the Japanese companies. At that point in time, those who were in the 30s, you know, they went out and they had to do, they had to explore and they had to do on their own. And that's how they, they learned or de developed their own skills. But we don't have that kind of positions today in Japan anymore. Thank you. Uh, I feel uh, Ishikawa Sensei is a true global leader. Her speak is, uh, you know, very straightforward, candid. Um, but uh, I, I do teach uh, new Japanese management, so yes. let me try to defend Jap Japan's position. Sure, sure. Although, you know, I agree with you. Uh, my father was like uh, the head of Los Angeles office when he was in the 20s, back then. So uh, currently, um, I, I don't think there's no branch manager in the 20s right now in big Japanese corporations. So the situation changed. A couple of things about Japan. You know, my career is a little bit different from ishikura I was raised in North America. I came back to Japan when I was, I was in high school. There's certain things about Japan that stands out. And it, it also touches ishikura concepts. Um, there are things that uh, in the West we tend to divide. Uh, but in the East, we can kind of embrace them. You know? uh, you know, Ishikura writes about the and concept. It's mm. not either or. Mm. How can we integrate them? How can we connect them? But these kind of, um, uh, you know, I feel, aspects are still the, here in Eastern how say, philosophy or culture. Companies like Toyota, for example, they are looking for fuel efficiency, but at the same time, the engine has a quite a strong torque, so it's powerful. That's an and question, not an either or question. So those kind of concepts are still there. Um, other thing, uh, culture and history is quite strong in Japan. A lot of the culture has been lost in Asia. If you look at the political leaders, if you look at the economic leaders of Asia, they don't talk so much about Asian values. I India, uh, Thai, a little bit. But if you go to Singapore, if you go to Hong Kong, they will talk a lot about like like United States or United Kingdom. So I feel if you can represent, you know, not just Japan but Asia uh, as a whole. Uh, Ishikawa Sensei was talking about Africa, 54 countries. Maybe uh, that's I think it's an advantage. Ishikawa Sensei, one, one last question sure. before we all open up. Um, you said um, you've made a certain you know uh, deliberate choices mm. that brought you here. Um, maybe if you, you know, did not apply for a business school, uh, if you hadn't gone to McKinsey, if you didn't become professor at Aoyama, um, you know, probably your life has changed. Um, and you write in your book that everyone has opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's whether you can grasp it yeah. or not. Can, can you provide us some advice on how to grasp or capture mm -hmm. that opportunity? Uh, as, I, as he mentioned, I, th I, I believe that everybody, in front of everybody, the opportunities pass. And I don't think there are some people who are lucky, who are more, uh, who have more opportunities than not. And I think the, 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 the issue is whether you identify it as an opportunity or not. That's one. And the second is that whether you grab it at that point in time or not. 
And a lot of people just don't think that's the opportunity. Once it's missed, that's gone. So you have to grab it. And you also need to think there isn't any perfect opportunity. And some people say, if these, all these items are satisfied, I will do 10 items. Then you will never do it. So if you think 10, there may be 10 items, but six is more or less going to that direction, I'll grab it and see what happens. Because time once it's lost, it's lost forever. Opportunities, if, you, if it passes by, it passes by. It doesn't come back. Some people think that there may be better opportunities, so let's wait. You can wait forever. Do you want to wait forever, or do you want to see whether this opportunity will lead to something a little different? And not every opportunity will deliver in the sense that you get what you wanted. But definitely, that leads you to something different, something new. And I would rather like to go into that route rather than wait for the better opportunity. And so uh, I, tend, I, I like something new all the time. So I tend to make a lot of mistakes. I tend to take some risks, and I suffer. But I think it's, I, I'm very confident that I made the right decision at that point in time. And when I grab the opportunity, sometimes the things don't turn out in the way that I want it, so I lose confidence. I don't think I can do this. But once you re realize that you lost confidence, you're not good at certain things, you can do several things. You can develop that, or you can forget about that and try something different. If you don't do anything, Nothing will happen. So I would, you know, I would really like to encourage you when you see something, some change or some opportunities for change or to do something new, grab it. And, and another thing is that be honest to yourself. Don't think about your family, your friends, what they, what they say to you. It's your life. You are the pilot. So don't do something that simply because somebody tells you to do that. That's somebody else's life. This is your life. You have to make a decision. And you have to navigate yourself. And I think that's the, the beauty of life. And it's what makes life so exciting and so interesting. If you leave, leave it to somebody else and you become an actor with a with producer behind you, I don't think that's too much fun. I would rather like to be a producer and actor and director, probably, and decide on what, what's, what this movie or what this show will bring to me and to the world. Thank you very much, Shikura Sensei. Uh, Let's give, give a warm a round of applause to Ishikawa Sensei. Now I'd like to open up. Uh, I think we covered uh, yeah, I think we quite a lot of uh, your questions, but now is your chance. Yeah, uh, well, I, I haven't really talked about the strength of Asia or in Japan. Uh, I talked about it in uh, global career. I think we have technology, environment. We have this hospitality and, you know, like, you know, trying to uh, care for others. And I think that's still true. And yet, we have been talking about it forever. And it really hasn't been materialized. So that was why I'm, I'm sort of ready to give up. And uh, probably you can, you can make that happen and make that uniqueness of Japan uh, to the world. And uh, I am in the position that I try to produce or promote uh, entrepreneurs or young people, regardless of the nationality, uh, to the world so that they will be known. And the same thing was true with technology and so forth. But uh, so far, 
uh, the Japanese companies or the government or the, uh, the, the leaders, at least, have not done much yet. A at least it doesn't seem that way uh, from the, the media and all these things. But we definitely do have one. And talking about the, uh, the, the strength of the Japanese people from the, uh, the, the people who, are, who work for the international organizations, they say, and I agree, that the, there are a lot of people who speak up too much, who are so loud, but don't see many views. But the Japanese tend to be much better at seeing both sides and sort of coordinate. And I think that's why I get invited as a moderator, because I'm not, I, I, I don't know enough about it. So I try to be objective, and I try to figure out where they are different. And I know quite a few people, a few Japanese working for the, the international organizations, uh, that is what they find as their uniqueness. So they get very overwhelmed by the people who talk so much. But you don't have to. I mean, you can just you know, watch closely and see how you can make a contribution. So there are many ways that you can do. You don't have to be, I mean, sometimes when I go to the US lately, I just can't stand, people are so loud. And they argue like crazy. I mean, particularly in the politics. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And I just don't want to hear any more of that. But that doesn't happen necessarily here. And I think that's where we can, we can offer something. Thank you. There, there, yeah. there was a question by a lady yeah. about moderating. Yeah. And I agree with Ishikura-san uh, that uh, if you can you know, uh, open up the sphere for every participant, um, I think that's value. And Japanese are respected very much because of our neutral position, especially in Asia. So if you can do that kind of a moderating, like Ishikura Sensei, I, I think you'll be called again. Um, OK, uh, yeah. yeah, please. Uh, Ishikura Sensei, thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. I'm Takao Saita. I see. OK. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, if I, my response is, uh, satisfies you or not. I think there are s two schools of thought, whether the, the, the digital or um, IT will widen the gap or reduce the gap. And I am in the, the reducing the gap camp. And you can argue either way. But I decided to take a chance because I think that's a great opportunity. For example, education is one very good example. By having the, the online education, you can make the, uh, the knowledge assets available to a lot and lots of people. So that will be a very close to the ideal world. And if no matter where you are, how old you are, or what, uh, what nationality you are, you can access to the best course in certain things, for example, at Stanford. And that may bring about some issues or some headaches later on. But I think for the beginning, for the time being, I think that's a great opportunity. Because I think the public knowledge or knowledge asset is for everybody. And the education is to make sure that everybody who wants to learn can learn. And I think that the technology and connecting the divided world will open up that opportunity. And if there are some devices later on, I will worry about it later on. But that's what I would like to do now. That's the first one. Would the that, second one. Would uh, that lead to the reason uh, why? Media you, design. Yeah. I, I, was, I want to change after about a decade. I don't want to do the same thing for a long, long period of time. Because I don't get as much excited as I start. And I've seen a lot of people who stay in one position too long, which does too much harm, even though they were great people. And I've seen so many cases, and I've been very critical. So I have to practice what I preach. So I decided to leave, hoping that others will leave. And they didn't. And uh, I think whenever the, the new leadership group comes on, the old guard should leave. And that's my very strong belief. And unless the old guards, the you know, chairman or ex-chairman stays, how can you be, how can you take the leadership? 
when that's the reality, you don't want them to come every day. And so that's, that's one of the reasons. So I wanted to change. But I have been very much interested in design thinking and the, also technology. Technology, without technology, I don't think you can discuss strategy today. And so that's, those are the two reasons why I was very interested in technology and design thinking. And I just had a chance to work with some people at KO. And they offered, and I have been, I mentioned that I'm very interested in design for a while, even before I did anything with KO. So some people knew that I was very interested in design. And so, and they offered me a job, so I grabbed. That's the one. Uh, Japanese position has been going down. And uh, as an individual, what do you need, what do you want to do? I don't, I am not that much conscious of being Japanese anymore. And I mean, once I come to think of it. And uh, I used to be more so, probably because I play that card, as I mentioned. Japan was in good shape. We had a lot to offer. A lot of people wanted to learn from us. But I don't think we have that much today. So I don't play that card as much, or I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not invited, or I'm not assigned as a vice chair because I'm Japanese, because we have nothing. We have so little to contribute. So I'm not very conscious of being Japanese. And I think quite a few people feel that way, it seems. And New Era, I, simply because it's 2013, and we're in January. <laughs> so I said, uh, I mean, you know, we can say last year was the beginning, but that doesn't sound too good. So I said, well, this year, January, let's see. This is the first year. Seizing the opportunity? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes me, it makes you feel much better. Okay, this is the beginning, right? So we can make it happen. And last year, we had a lot of political elections and a lot of events which should, you know, shape. So last year, I, I probably I said, well, this is the beginning or something. But this is really the beginning. Mismatch in education. Um, I don't think the, the schools particularly, the well, higher education hasn't offered too much anyway. And uh, the primary education hasn't offered that much either now. And I think we're hurting. And uh, for example, I am very much surprised how little critical thinking and logical thinking, as well as communication, whether in English or in Japanese, the, the people are trained. And they just haven't been trained. That's all. They do have a potential. But they have never been trained to express their views, to explain and to argue and to build the logic. And you have to start from grade school. You have to start from home. I had a chance to work with the, the uh, middle school and high school students three days ago. And we, did, we, we, we made the workshop. And we let them work or come up with the new ideas. And, but they have never had that kind of experience. But they do quite well. So if we keep on doing it, then they become much, much better. But you have to start so early. And it's, it's amazing we don't offer that kind of opportunities. Fear of change? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Why are they, what, one, one thing which I do is that I ask them what they are afraid of, sort of item by item and see whether that still holds true or whether we could do something to reduce that fear. Because sometimes fear seems so overwhelming. It becomes out of proportion. And it's, you sort of crashed. But if you say, OK, what do I lose? I mean, do I lose face? That's OK, right? Kind of things. So if you can figure out. What are the kind of things that you are afraid of? And examine each one, whether, you know, the, what's the worst scenario? 
And if you can accept that, I think that will make much better. But I don't, I usually do not like to play with this fear factor. I would rather like to play with the potential. So for example, you know, English, I think is a de facto standard. And some people say, unless you have communication, English communication capability, you're dead. I mean, that's, that's pretty, you know, scary. And you seem to be under stress, right? Under pressure. But I said, well, if you communicate, if you can communicate in English, the whole world is yours, which is true. And you can open up to so many different things. Why not, you know, join us there rather than, you know, playing in a very small field? It's much more fun, and you find much more things, new things in the bigger field. So that's how I would like to argue. So try to bridge what I think they still, they call it like bridge or something, you know, try to figure out the vision. Time, a couple more questions maybe, two or three, yes. Um, thank you very much for the uh, inspiring presentation. Um, you just mentioned that you're not conscious about being Japanese anymore. And I understand that because um, I, when I was in college in the uh, United States, I felt the same way. And I was wondering if that's what it means to be global. And I, th does that make sense? I, um, I know what you mean. Right. But and I don't think it's necessarily what it means by global. I, I'm not too crazy about the term global anymore right. either. Yeah. No, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if we pursue global career and as a person from a society of Japan, is that something we need to fear that we, we're going to lose our nationality I if we pursue yeah, that? I, see, I, see. Yeah. I don't think we'll, any, nothing will change the fact that I'm Japanese and I'm from Japan. I have my own identity as Japanese. But I, whether I'm conscious of that or not is a different question. And you need, I mean, this is, this is not or issue. This is end issue. You can be global and you can be, you, you can be, you can be Japanese and you can operate globally. And uh, what did, uh, Carlos Ghosn said something very interesting. The global, globalization is the reality. And he said something about you can make the best of the globalization and uh, by being Japanese or something of that sort. I have to, I have to check my, my uh, note. But he said something uh, a very interesting. You know, you can, you, can be, you can make the positive view of globalization. I think a lot of people take the, the very negative view of globalization. The same thing was true with competition. I think competition is great. And competition, without competition, I become so lazy. And competition is something that you try to be better. It's not zero sum game. It's a positive sum game. So you can be different and you can play and you can be a winner. It doesn't mean that if you're a winner, somebody else is gonna be a loser all the time. It's not like, you know, game, you know, shogi or something. So that's, that's what I think. Two more questions. <coughs> who, yeah, who do you think uh, the, the successful global leaders from Japan? Are there anybody in particular you pay attention to or you admire because of his or her ways of um, building global um, career? Uh, good question, right? I, I like s several people, and but I don't necessarily like them because I feel that they're global or you know global global. So and I think in in a way, even though this the title of this book is Global Career, we named Global Career simply because global was a uh, hot word. <laughs> so we thought if you say it global career, it may sell. So <laughs> that, that's, that's, the, rea that's the, the, the real reason. So it used to be like strate career strategic shift or something of that sort, because I wanted to talk about the shift. But we said, well, global career sounds uh, much, uh, much better. 
at that point in time. So that's why. Uh, global leaders from Japan. Well, Yoshitohori is one of them, I think, who started Globus. And uh, I, like, I like Kiyoshi Kurokawa, whom I worked with. He's a, he's a, very, he's a very interesting and uh, in inspiring guy. And uh, let's see, who do I like? I like, um, I like a lot of musicians and sports people, probably. And uh, who else? Business people, um, though not that well known, I was very impressed by uh, Nakani-san of Hitachi. He is, uh, I, I had a chance to moderate the panel with him as well as Ginny Romeli of IBM and uh, Hirano-san of Mitsubishi, Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ. Both Hirano-san and uh, Nakani-san are very, uh, very global in many ways, and, but they are very, uh, they're good, Nakani-san in particular is very decisive uh, leader. And let's see, that's a very good question. I used to have a lot of list of uh, professionals, but I, I guess one of the things is that I think today everybody has to be a leader and everybody has to be a creator. Everybody has to be a creative leader. And leader is not just a charismatic leader. A leader is much more like a role. And uh, so everybody has to have a leadership. And that's what you know I, I am leaning to. And I used to say, particularly in Japan, the, the leadership has to stay, has to start with everybody. Because we are very good at, we are, the ordinary people are very flexible, resilient, and can make decisions. The leaders, what they call leaders, quote unquote, and the organizations or the, the government are the ones who can't make a decision. It became very clear at the time of the earthquake. So the people on the street can make a decision, they can adapt, they can take actions, they can get things done. And I think that's the leadership that we need today. And so everybody has a leadership potential. Everybody has to play the leadership role. And I think it's a big mistake to wait for the charismatic leader to solve all the problems. I don't think it's possible. And so in, in a way, the, the today the things have changed so that we, it forces us, every single one of us, to take the leadership. But we still are with the old model of one super leader can do a lot of things. I don't think it's the case anymore. So um, I totally agree with Ishiko Sensei. Hi. Ishiko Sensei, you had some brochures Hi. that yeah. You, yeah. I have uh, two announcements. There's a DBJ. This is for women only. They have a business plan contest for women entrepreneurs. And so, if you're interested, I think the the first uh, award is Isema. So that's a big deal. And uh, too bad it's just for women, but you have <laughs> you have pretty good chances. The second one is starting in June, I'm holding another round of Global Agenda Seminar. And that will lead, that will include some of the, the little bit of a problem solving type of things as well as communication, discussion at the beginning. And then we have three uh, guests and a very interesting discussion. So, and uh, we will start the, the public relations and sales pitch and so forth, but I would like you to be aware. We meet once a month for three hours over the weekend. And that has become a very interesting network of people who are interested in, uh, for example, attending the international conferences uh, later on.
So that's, those are the two things. And by the way, I, have, I, I host the, uh, the event called Davos Experience in Tokyo in, on Friday, 1st of February, and at, from 7 to 9. And I will announce it on my blog soon. But uh, that's something that you might uh, want to be, uh, you might be interested. What we plan to do is uh, we will see some of the webcast from Davos. And then we'll break out into the, the discussion groups. And we'll have a sort of a very interesting Davos-style uh, brainstorming session. And then that will be followed by reception networking event. So that's, uh, those are the, uh, the, the things that I plan to do. Thank you very much. Uh, can maybe ah, so, so. people who, who like to yes. have the, the brochures Hi. for the business plan contest for women, Isemaya, 10 million yen, that's, that's big, yeah. to, to start your business. Mm -hmm. And if you can take a look at my blog, there is a lot of information. I have two, but you can you can check the uh, my blog in English. Uh, in in Japanese too. Okay, uh, Ishikura Sensei. Hi. Thank you very much for the inspiring speech. Uh, let's give another round of applause.